Welcome to chapter 14, the last chapter in services marketing. And chapter 14 is an important chapter because for the first 13 chapters, we've been talking about the production of a service, assuming that the service will go right. Now we've mentioned at various points, aspects in terms of the gap model, where you look at customer dissatisfaction and controlling what could create uh, gaps between expectation and perception. We talk about metrics that uh, involve measuring to ensure that we're delivering on service promises. We mentioned the flower of service in terms of augmentations uh, to the service product that can enhance service behavior and service, again, service, service satisfaction. This is a specific set of ideas in this chapter that talk about what happens when it goes wrong. And the most important philosophical worldview of services marketing is that we think in terms of when it breaks, not if it breaks. Because the nature of the beast is that we have intangibility, heterogeneity, and those are critical. Services are inconsistent. They will be offered in a different way, different times. They are impacted on by the environment, by the state of the customer, by the state of the employee. The service scape can on a beautiful summer's day versus a raining winter's day. The environment physically has changed even though there is nothing you as a service provider can do to modify the conditions. So services that worked one day can fail the next simply because the factors, environmental factors have shifted. So we spend our entire service operation thinking about fault tolerance and service recovery. When it goes wrong, how do we recover? So overall, the first rule of services marketing is get it right first time. So do the job right first time, plus when it breaks, effective complaint handling, which effective complaint handling is in fact doing the job right. So if you have a customer who has a complaint, that complaint is valid, that complaint needs to be listened to, and we talk about it in terms of a customer's complaint being valid because service quality and satisfaction is subjective and perceived. So if we're not actually engaging with the customer and we're not thinking about their satisfaction, so when they have a problem, our job is to solve that problem to enhance their satisfaction, and that's your recovery. So we've got the model here. It's a Cutler special. It's how does dissatisfaction occur and be processed by a customer. So this is a flowchart, this is an if-then statement. So the customer is dissatisfied with the service. There has been a gap or there's been a service failure. Choice number one is action or no action. No action is you take the hit, you take the loss, you walk on. So you go to the corner, you go out for takeaway coffee, you taste the coffee, the coffee is awful, it's closer to a bin than it is to the coffee store, you discard the coffee, you walk on. Following day you go back, you buy the same brand style and type of coffee from the same place because, you know, it's been fine, it was fine on Monday, it's rubbish on Tuesday, it's great again on Wednesday, and Thursday it's probably fine again. So no action is taken. Your next approach is you take some action. So you're staying on the coffee, you've picked up your takeaway coffee, it tastes foul, you've turned on your heel, you've gone back to the store. Now, you may, on the turn on your heel, you've gone back to the store, you're going for redress. You go back to the barista and say, hey, this thing, this is awful. What, what has gone wrong with this coffee? They can, um, have the opportunity then to immediately redress the problem, maybe a replacement coffee, maybe a refund. It can escalate. You may need to go to legal action to get your redress. 
you may find that this is a recurring, you are sufficiently dissatisfied about the treatment you have in the redress that you go to a, uh, you can complain to fair trading, you can go to uh, complain to the business itself, if it's a franchise, the franchise owner, government agencies, there are ways and means. But all these are public actions, all these are visible active steps. You also then have the opportunity for private action, where you can decide that instead of notifying the firm, you will just discontinue. You'll disconnect, you'll stop buying, or you'll engage in word of mouth, negative word of mouth. Tell your friends, don't go there, don't, don't go to this place, this is my experience, here's my horror story. The thing about these actions is that from a marketer's perspective, the best news on a service failure is public action, immediate redress from the business. This is this sequence of something goes wrong, I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to do something about it by going back to openly now, going back to the firm saying, hey, a problem just took place. That gives us then the opportunity to fix that problem, because we may not have been aware of it. The barista might have spent the entire morning using cinnamon instead of sugar for the coffees. It could be a feature. It's, it may become a feature. It could be a bug. They didn't notice because they were very busy and the labeling was off. Without someone coming back and saying, hey, why does this thing taste like Christmas? It's July. You don't have that redress. You can't fix the problem, That you can't resolve the problem if you're unaware of it. So a customer coming to you and complaining is always an opportunity. What you don't want, and the worst case scenario for a marketer, is private action boycott, private action word of mouth. A boycott then becomes a lost customer. So we start having to talk about customer recovery. But we've lost this customer and we don't know why we've lost this customer. And that is problematic. This is one of the positive things about social media, by the way. You can note it's a 2000 model, but there isn't actually complain, public action complain publicly on social media. I would sit somewhere there-ish. A public complaint on social media gives the brand an opportunity to engage on social media to redress the problem. So it's seek indirect redress from a business firm. So, as I mentioned, the best case scenario, if something breaks, is a complaining customer. It's market research intel. Number one, your customer's got the wherewithal to come back to you and say, hey, problem. You now have an opportunity to apologize, resolve, but also find the limits of the, you know, I won't say interrogate, but get information from the customer about what went wrong. Not just it broke, what were the steps that you were able to undertake before it broke is quite a significant question. So complaint is opportunity, it gives you market research. It's mystery shopping without the mystery. This is a real life customer. This is real life quality. So you get feedback that um, you may need to pick up your assurancing or your monitoring. It also helps us establish if there are customer-centric standards we've missed. And that's one of the big ones at the moment. So there's a lot of societal social change in place where we are not necessarily, as designers, executives, or people responsible for creating a product, we're not always aware of the standards that we'd like to see from audiences who aren't like us. And this is why diversity is a really important facet in product creation, product development, service design. Don't, if you're doing a service, you're building a service, you look around the table and all the people working on the service look exactly like you, something's gone wrong. You're not going to, you are only going to be able to initially sell to people who look like you. Break open the design, get more diverse views in because customer centric standards are important and they'll also cut off the risk that what you see as a feature is in fact a giant bug for an audience when 
the customers come back and complain to you, then you've got a sense for, are our customer centric standards up to scratch? What is the complaint? How do we embed those issues into as an opportunity to enhance our problem? And also you'll find problems for resolution. And if customer complaints, if you've got a complaint from a customer, it's a problem to be solved. The solution might actually be a new product offering. The solution might be, so you have a customer who comes to you and says, look, this coffee is, this cup is too large, or this cup is difficult to, you know, you've got the Grande, ex, the Grande uh, Express, the giant cup that's too big. It's like, well, what do you actually want? Well, we want smaller serves. Okay, new product. We want faster or slower or different. So the resolution may be able to give you an opportunity to identify a problem, create a solution, and that solution can lead to a product. Okay, I want you to go co-create time, back to the book, look over those case studies, look over that material, 409 to 412, give the textbook a good solid go over, and read the cases, because complaint behavior is very case study oriented, very case study driven, and it's very exemplar. As with a lot of the other theory, it's really important to understand that not everything works for every framework, but complaints are important, frequent and need to be resolved. So the more you can learn from different sources, the better it becomes for you. All right, service recovery paradox. Here we go. It has been discovered that if you have a good service recovery on a poor service, you are more likely to be a loyal customer of that service. What's also been discovered is as soon as you realize that the customer, the service provider is screwing up the product, you become a very unhappy customer and a very disloyal customer. So a bad recovery on a service will also create a super disloyal customer. So the service recovery paradox, uh, yes, it is a paradox in a sense that increased loyalty as a result of a failure, but it's not a paradox in the sense that there was a perceptions expectations event. There's a critical event, the core service. The core service failed. The service recovery becomes the second critical event. It comes with a perception expectation. A good service recovery that creates a delight will create a satisfaction with the brand, but it's still a service failure. So there is still a service problem that needs to be redressed. And there is still the element that the service isn't working or didn't work. And that is a problem that has to be solved. So you need to be considering that service recovery paradox it exists, but it is not something to intentionally trigger. So what is, in terms of customer complaint behavior, what do we know about the type of customer and how they're likely to complain? And what encourages complaint behavior? So first and foremost, the level of breach. Minor breaches may not incur comment. So your dissatisfaction level. The level of dissatisfaction then becomes basically almost a consumer behavior question of problem recognition, search for a solution, and the steps involved there. So what is the cost of complaining? Again, search behavior. Oh, I've had a problem. Hey, this is easy for me to complain, to seek redress and solution. No real uh, skin off my nose to do this. I'll give them the heads up. What is the benefit? So it's a cost benefit trade off. In a complaint behavior, if you tell someone that there is a problem, what is the likelihood of it becoming increasingly your problem or the problem getting fixed? And attributions. We've mentioned that previously, but the attribution of is it my fault because the problem occurred? Is it your fault because the problem occurred? 
If the customer thinks that it's their problem, it's therefore their fault, they're unlikely to complain because they'd have to come up and say, hey, I screwed up and I got it wrong. Can you solve me being wrong? It's very ego draining. And the demographic factors. Complainants tend to be younger, better educated, above average income, high self-confidence, and the kicker, a positive attitude towards self-activism. So basically, if you think that you have an entitlement to restitution and the confidence to go up and seek restitution and believe that there is something worthwhile doing this, yeah, high self-confidence, positive attitude to self-activism. Every now and then, when you're dealing with academic research, you'll find yourself staring at something going, that is patently obvious. Here's the thing. Until it's measured, tested, retested, and confirmed, it's not obvious. It has to be measured, tested, and checked because until that point, it's an assumption. Once it's been assessed and the assumption turns out to hold true, then with 2020 vision and clarity of hindsight, we can go, wow, that's obvious. Or we can go, okay, that is now confirmed information, information we can act upon. So when you do come across research that looks like it's obvious, it looks like it's obvious because it was an assumption. But when we do these assumption tests, we are looking for disconfirmation as much as confirmation. We are wanting to check that, in fact, an idea that we all take as, well, that's how it works, right, is actually how it works. So disconfirmation is a very important facet in market research and marketing research. Occasionally, yeah, it does lead you to looking at things like a complaint behavior. If you think that complaining will get you somewhere, you will complain. Well, it's not always, it doesn't always hold up to be that obvious. All right, let's talk about theory here. Let's talk about the consequences of dissatisfaction and the consequences of poorly resolved or poorly recovered services. So switching behaviors. If you think about when we started talking about growth strategies for services, one of the ideas was to take service, take customers from your competitors. An existing market, maybe a new product, or an existing product and a new market. In terms of creating switching behavior, we can create barriers and one of the areas you actually want to look into this is in social marketing, we have a lot of work done on preventing switching. Because if we get someone to start healthy eating, we want to put up barriers to them switching back to unhealthy eating. So a lot of the switching, service switching behaviors and service switching ideas are very useful for government, nonprofit, political and social change, as well as commercial. Again, with a model like this, what we're looking at, this is a way of describing the world. What are the switching behaviors we can see? There has been a core service failure. Something has gone wrong. Uh, there's the service catastrophe. So we're not going back there. We can never go back. It's always great when you have a service story like that. It's like, well, I can never go back there again. Pricing, you are not getting value for money or there's been a, a loss of trust because of price. And you'll note that frequently I talk about price in terms of it needs to be obvious and something that the customer can calculate. This is because one of the big switching reasons for switching, server switching, is a sense of unfair pricing or deceptive pricing. Because price is used as a metric for quality. And if you think the price is lying, then you're going to feel that you're being deceived over the quality of the service. 
Other areas that trigger switching behavior is response to failure. If it's a poor response or a reluctant response. The inconvenience, distribution issues, that often ties in, inconvenience tends to tie into a combination of it's difficult to get to, the hours aren't great, the location's not great, competition emerges at a better, more convenient location. So competition based on distribution can trigger switching behavior. And the final thing is the involuntary switching. And this is where you have to switch because you ran out of service provider. And if you're into live music in Canberra, you may be, have, well, you're going to experience a lot of this uh, as the independent bookstores, cafes, and cinemas start shutting up shop. So involuntary switching is where you move as a customer. So you go from Canberra to Melbourne or Perth or somewhere else. Involuntary switching because the service provider uh, shut up shop. Now one of the things I want to point out here is there's an ethical element of why we seek profit. In the pricing and the discussion of pricing, we talked about ensuring that you cover all of your costs so that you can continue operating. And this is, in switching behavior, trying to prevent involuntary switching where you are providing a service, the service is beneficial to customer, client, and community, and you need to ensure that you are sustainable, that your profit is covering your costs and that you can continue in the long term of meeting these needs over time. So involuntary switching is almost like an ethics fail or a pricing fail. You didn't do the job necessary to allow this service to continue meeting the needs of a market that was benefiting from it. And that's where profit is good. All right, service recovery. Let's talk systems. Remember the first slide? Get it right. Effective complaint handling. Satisfaction. Effective complaint handling is, first and foremost, you've got to be able to identify the problem. Second is you've got to be able to resolve the problem. And then you've got to make the problem go away. And this is the bit where people kind of stop it on a regular basis is not recognizing service complaints or treating a complaint as time to break out the lawyers. Oh, you gave me two stars on Yelp. I will sue you. As opposed to, huh, I got two stars on Yelp. Was this the right customer? Oh dear, that was completely the wrong customer. The business traveler who stayed at the youth hostel, wrong. Yeah, you, you went for the cheap, but you didn't get the what you wanted. You can identify and say this person, look, we'll refund you the money because you're the wrong customer. You're, not, you're never going to be happy here, so don't come back. So you can sack customers. You need to, in identifying service complaints, understand that a complaint isn't personal for you but the service failure is personal to them. So you can be dispassionate about your service of like, okay, right, there's a problem. The problem needs to be solved for this to continue working, but the person is upset. Their feelings are valid. They're entitled to feelings and their feelings are valid. So the service recovery experience, the other things that you need to be thinking into this is how to make a service recovery work. And there's a few aspects here. You need management support. There is no service recovery that survives in the face of a disinterested management. If your upper hierarchy does not support, does not believe that there is a problem, service recovery will not take place. You want to really see the complaint as an opportunity to do something different, do it better, develop a new product, solve the problem. So complaint is opportunity. That said, you also want to be mindful that complaint of this is the wrong customer is opportunity to redirect the customer. Training and empowerment, your staff need to be able to solve the problem. 
And you as a firm need to go, all right, this is a problem. This is our problem and a problem we're going to solve. The other aspects that work in this, and this is sort of looking at closing up. This is your checklist on a service failure. Act fast. Get in and go, there is a problem taking place. We're going to try and solve this so the customer knows that you are aware and you care. If you're going to apologize, I'm going to say it here for a second for a reason, actually apologize. If you're not going to apologize, double down. So either you go in and say, I'm sorry, and that you are sorry, or you double down. You don't issue a faux apology of, oh, I'm sorry if you were. Oh, I'm sorry if you were inconvenienced. No, don't do that. No faux apologies, no defensiveness. If you're not going to apologize, you double down, turn around and say, this is a feature. So if someone was complaining and wanted an apology from the Tough Mudder course for the fact that they got wet, dirty and sore, the answer to that would be no apologies, it's a feature. You knew it was you knew what you were buying when you came in. Tough luck. Versus, oh I'm sorry if you were inconvenienced and discomforted it. I mean, I'm so if you ever find yourself saying I'm sorry if Stop. Just stop. Don't. Service recovery is about solving the problem. Phopologies are about trying to say that the problem isn't yours and the problem exists with the person complaining. And that isn't services marketing. So don't. Because you're breaching the next point. You're showing, if you say, I'm sorry, if you are not showing any understanding of the problem from the customer's perspective. And this leads down to either, if you're going for recovery, don't argue. If you're not going for recovery, don't argue with the customer's feelings. You can turn around and say, look, service isn't for you. Your discomfort is a result of you being the wrong person for the service. This is the kind of customer we want. You're not that. Double down. Now, the thing about doubling down is that if you find out that nobody wants to deal with you afterwards, your product was wrong. So you can double down. You might find yourself suddenly with a queue of customers going, well, yeah, that's, that's the kind of service I want. Great. But no faux apology. Don't correct the customer's feelings. Don't tell the customer that they're wrong for how they feel. Their feelings are real because service Perception governs reality. And lastly, to solve up and do a service recovery, tell the customers what's going to happen. If you go to a customer, look, the customer comes to you, complains about uh, it's dry cleaning service, the product is damaged, they, they've put a suit in to be repaired, the repairs haven't been done, it's come back stained. Turn to the customer and say, these are the steps that we're going to take. We're going to try to fix the repair. We're going to try to remove the stain. If you do not wish us to do that ourselves, we will contract another firm to do the repairs and the removal. This is the likely time period this will take. We will let you know when your stuff is ready to be picked up, or we will let you know if the repairs were unsuccessful. If the repairs are successful, cleaning successful, it's on us, it's on the house. If it's unsuccessful, we will compensate you, buy you a new suit. Clear statements of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, who's responsible for making it happen, and offers of compensation, fiscal and temporal. Make up time for people, make up, don't make the service recovery process more time intensive for the person, for the customer, because that's not service recovery, that's basically trying to defraud them. So yes, there's a service recovery process, but it'll take you six weeks is not a genuine recovery process. If your intention of taking it, of making it difficult is to try and discourage or try to create a service environment. You want to make your service environment really easy for people to seek direct redress when a problem goes wrong. You want to make it so that you don't find yourself encouraging legal action, but you also don't want to have 
a service structure set up so that people go, I'll take action. Oh, wow, that's a lot of hard work to get service recovery. Oh, I'll just quit going to this thing. I'll stop. I'll start boycotting or I won't buy. It's not the most optimum approach. It's not the best way you can do it. So that is chapter 14. That's the end game from here for you. If you need me, there's the points of contact. What I would recommend is that you take the opportunity now, having completed the chapters, to read the case studies that are at the end of the book. Each of these case studies comes with a set of questions. If you can read through the case study and then look at these questions, and either in your head or on a piece of paper, jot down bullet point answers to the questions there, you know that your confidence is going to be there. This is a self-directed self-exercise of what is this question asking? Can I answer it? If I can answer it, can I answer it using the theory that I've learned this semester? Can I draw to the literature review materials? Can I draw to the questions I've addressed? Can I draw to the answers I've provided elsewhere in this course? Can I draw on the references I've learnt? Hey, I can do that. I'm in a really good position. I can, I'm really ready for this exam. So use it as an exam preparation tool. The other thing is that the examples, the content that are in the case studies, fair game to be used as citations to practice in exam questions. So congrats on making it through 14 chapters and your next stage is to get your notes together, get your, make certain your ideas are all sorted, finish off the assessment task for the semester, and congratulations again. This has been a full semester. Well done. You have been working on this. It's the other aspect I want you to be really clear on. It's the last thing I'm going to say to you on these elements that as you have progressed through these chapters, reading the chapter, watching the videos, engaging with the literature review, you've been co-producing this. This course is not about me. It's not about what are these videos. It is about you, the change that you have undertaken, the knowledge that you have gained, the fact that you've thought through these, you've listened to these, you've thought through the examples, you've read the slides, you have co-produced your education experience here. So when you walk into that exam, you are in a position to co-create something new. You can come up with answers to these questions. You are ready to do this. So from here, Walk tall, hold your head high, you're ready to go in, you're ready to take on these exam questions, you know your stuff, you're a marketing student, think like a marketer, conduct yourself like a marketer, and you are good to go. So thank you for coming along on the journey, thank you for being part of this, and go have some fun with that exam, because it's going to be great.